Um, so as Allison said, I'm Trisha. Um, I own a PR agency in town with a partner, Christine Gleed, and we've only had it for about um, just over one and a half years. But prior to that, I was the vice president of another PR firm in town called Tartan Group for like six or seven years, or five years maybe, something like that a long time. And um, I started my career, I came to PR by way, kind of a lady path, by way of journalism. Um, no, started actually at UVic a long time ago. I have an undergraduate in women's studies and <laughs> had to decide what I was going to do with that and went on to journalism school and worked most of my beginning of my career as a journalist in Houston, Texas, a couple of places. Um, that's where I got my first writing job at Health and Fitness Magazine. And so I worked there for several years in a few other kind of local publications in Houston and Dallas. And then um, lived in Calgary for about six or seven years and had a variety of roles. I changed at that time. Um, from use my writing skills in a communication and got hired in communications roles for the first time. So I had a stint in oil and gas like Susan did. Um, worked for another small agency and my, my best job that I had there, which was about the last three years before I moved here, was as the spokesperson for Alberta Children's Hospital, which was a lovely role. So yeah, that's a bit about me. And I have an undergraduate or a um, graduate degree from here and an MBA from 2007. I'm Jason Finnerty. I uh, I'm a freelance writer here in Victoria. I guess my career sort of started. I did 20 years of uh, corporate world: 10 at McDonald's, 10 at Shaw, to fairly diverse place, and uh, then decided to come back to school. Chose Royal Roads, got my degree here, and fell in love with marketing and advertising. Um, worked for a local agency, uh, Copeland, for a little while until I kind of went. I'd really like to do this myself, and pulled the pen, went home, and started my own business. And that was three years ago this month, and it's been fantastic. I have clients all over the island, um, through BC. Uh, being freelance, it's quite nice that I can have people on the East Coast, and Australia, and Thailand, and Victoria all on the same day. It uh, makes it for an interesting, uh, very interesting, but sometimes long day. But, uh, yeah, that's me. Hi, I'm Susan Jones. I work for the Times Colonist. Um, when I describe my career to people, when I asked, um, I tell them that I have two career paths that I've followed my entire life. The first career path um, started when I was five years old. Um, and that's my volunteer career path. And then I have my professional work career path that keeps the roof over my head and, and food on the table and that sort of thing. So my volunteer career path is very important to me and I'm very passionate about it. And when I was five, I used to visit the old folks home, which is what they called it back in the day, on Sunday afternoons to have tea with the senior citizens. Um, and of course you can imagine the kind of education that I was able to elicit. Um, doing that until I was the age of 12. Um, today, uh, in volunteering, I am working on um, uh, working with the society as the chair, new chair of Amalgamation Yes. And that's about bringing the 13 communities that we have here in Victoria um, together to find efficiencies in governance and, and um, working together. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, the other side of my professional um, career path has spanned everything from um, oil and gas, Hewlett Packard, um, commercial property management, I, I was one of the first female commercial property managers in Calgary, Alberta, to um, building 16 kilometer trails in a remote area of BC with 24 youth for 18, or eight months, that took five years though to bring that, that together, um, to helping the Clackwet Biosphere Reserve. Um, come to fruition that we all know today um, to this. I sell ads for the Times Colonist <laughs> and I have a lot of fun doing it. So I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you for inviting me and I look forward to your questions. Uh, my name is Jeff. I, uh, I got my start in, in uh, sort of communications journalism field back when I was about 17 and I was a really big sports fan. And I just really wanted the job in, in writing sports. That's why I got into journalism. And uh, it, it basically took me into about an 18-year career writing sports. I ended up uh, 
after three or four different papers at the Times columnist for, for, for Mike Stud was at the Times columnist as a sports writer for 18 years. Um, and then on to the, the covering politics with Times columnist in the legislature for about seven. Then I decided I needed a change and I switched over to communications and uh, went to the BC government and was a communications director in several different ministries. And just most recently I switched over to the representative for children and youth. And um, if you're not familiar with that office, uh, it's Mary Ellen Tupel Vaughn's office and she is basically a watchdog to make sure that children, especially children in the care of the government, are getting a fair shake in BC. And, um, and so that's quite interesting work. We do a lot of different reports there. We just came out with one yesterday called Still Waiting. We just released it in Vancouver. So I was doing a media event over in Vancouver yesterday. It's uh, on the uh, Child and Youth Mental Health Services, mostly for youth who are transition age. But this is another report we put out a couple of months ago. So I do a lot of writing that way, um, as well as media, um, media managing for Mary Ellen and uh, inter arranging interviews and strategizing and that sort of thing. Uh, the other the other part of my writing career has been being an author and back in uh, I, I guess I always wanted to write a book like every newspaper writer and uh, um, I was covering sports here covering high school basketball which I, I love basketball and a uh, uh, kid named Steve Nash came through high school basketball here and I thought he was pretty good so uh, followed his career while he was at university and about two or three years into that I decided might be a good idea to do my first book on him. So I did this book with him, and he really helped me out a lot. We, I went down to uh, a lot of his games and um, NCAA tournament and the draft and everything when he was in his senior year at Santa Clara. We came up with this. And then about 10 years later, we did a reprise, or maybe it was a little, it was a little longer than that. After he won his second MVP, we did another version for a bigger publisher. I did a Canucks book back in, remember what year it was, 2005, I think, kind of a 35 year retrospective. The title's a bit of a, what's that word? Uh, Canucks Legends, it doesn't quite go together, but it was, a, it was a look at a bunch of different Canucks over the years, and it was a lot of fun to do. And then um, that sort of spawned into a, fic, a little bit of a fiction writing career. I've done five kids' <coughs> fiction books for, uh, for Orca books, and this is what I really like doing. It's just that finding the time to do it is hard, so. And then the other side of what I love to do is I have a couple of kids and uh, I, I coach in the community. I've coached a lot of different sports, but most recently a basketball coach at St. Michael's where my son goes to school. So that's, uh, that's probably why I haven't written any books lately. I've been too busy with that. That's, that's it in a nutshell, basically. Thank you. Um, so I'll just start the discussion off with a question. Um, what advice do you have for recent graduates? That. Um, yeah, that good. I think, I mean, when I have people come my way and are looking for a job, some of the things that I look for are how well versed they are just in what's going on in the world, if they're really paying attention to current events. Um, also, I mean, coming from where a lot of us come from, I really look for good writing skills. So really hone those writing skills as best you can while you're in school, because obviously it's a time where you have lots of practice. And if you have a passion for it, then do some of those side projects, like, like what Jeff does or others, that get you out there, you know, even if it's not being published. I always, my one piece of advice that I give, and that I now give this, I think, because when I was a journalist, and even in my early days of communications, I felt like I couldn't be as strong of a communicator as I wanted to be because I had a bit of a blind spot over here, and that was about really how the business world worked. Really getting down to the, the meat and potatoes of how it worked. I had a blind spot in the sort of corporate finance ways and, that, and, and other financial things. And if you really want to have a seat at the table where you can be really effective as a communicator, as a journalist, or really in a lot of different avenues that you'll work, you have to figure out how money is made. And how, so for each of my clients, I think, you know, I, they want me to communicate something. It could be something as simple as a fishing derby. I just wrote a media release this morning at 5 in the morning for one of my clients, so Bay Marine Group. But it's really all about how you're helping them achieve their business goals. And you have to have an understanding of what their business goals are and why, and how, the, how they generate their revenue in order to do whatever it is they do. So my advice is really to try and get the whole picture while you're here at school and know a little bit about all those different pieces of business so that you then can bring those into the different roles that you'll have over the years. And I think that can, for one thing, makes you get higher and helps you really be effective in any role that you take on. 
Um, my advice for you, for new graduates, and pretty much everyone, would be try and find yourself, uh, define work-life balance for yourself. Um, a lot of people are really interested in, in going out and being gung-ho and doing 18-hour days. It's pretty hard to be sustainable with that, but for some people it, it does work, and that, that's fine, but don't go chasing after everybody else and trying to do the same thing as them. Just figure out what works best for you, enjoy life, we live paradise here, so, other than today. Uh, but yeah, find your own work-life balance. Um, I would give anybody, uh, new graduates or otherwise, um, this one piece of advice. Learn some really, really basic selling skills. Because everything that you do, whether you're in front of an employer, um, you're out there raising money for a foundation, um, you need really basic selling skills. And I'm not clear that those are taught very well in any education environment, so you typically have to go outside to gain those skills. Um, with, you know, many, there's many private institutions that, and you can do some of it online too, but get those selling skills and get them down pat. I just have a couple of points I'd say. First of all, find something you really love to do, and then try to find a way to do it as your job because that's you know, for 18 years I was a sports writer I just loved sports and I still do but that was a great way not to really work for a while uh, <laughs> and you know I, I I would just recommend that I think that's a really good thing um, second thing it would would be if you stop liking what you're doing then find something else because if you're involved in communications and you can write you can do a lot of different things and I didn't really realize that until I was well, even, even as a sports writer, I kind of had a blind spot there. I didn't think, I thought that's all I could do, but, you know, there's different kinds of writing. And then when you get out of kind of the journalist, journalism author kind of mode and you realize that there's all kinds of other communications roles, and just to build on what was said previously, I mean, communications plays a huge role in decision making in government and in private sector, and you can be a, a big voice in the and the policy and decision making table, you're a part of the executive in most places you're at. You're really making a big difference in how something is presented and, um, well, for lack of a better word, sold to people. Like, I mean, it's, it, it, a lot of it comes down to how things are communicated. And if they're communicated well, it really helps. Um, and the other thing I would just say as a writer, I think I, I've taught a few writing classes at Camosun just uh, for writing for kids and stuff. And I think the biggest thing is, if you want to become a good writer, read like crazy. It's sort of like um, it's sort of like being a jazz musician, which my youngest brother is, and you know he he kind of got where his style by listening and listening and listening and trying to cop other people's style and stuff. And I think writing is the same way. I'm not saying plagiarize people. I'm just saying <laughs> I'm just saying if you like a style somebody writes, then find other people that write like that because the more you read, the more you absorb and sort of then find your own voice. And I think that's important for you know, writing a good news release or writing a book or writing a newspaper. All right, so it's open to discussion. So if there's any questions in the audience, feel free to raise your hand or stand up and ask our hands. <coughs> I noticed that writing has come up a lot. And for those individuals that don't feel like writing is a strong point, um, how would you recommend that we go about, you said, read a lot? Um, is there any mistakes, or are there any mistakes rather that you would say you see a lot in graduates that we could prevent, maybe, from writing? That's a good question. If, in case anyone didn't hear it, the question is if writing's not your strong point, what um, what can you do to improve upon it? And, and if we see something frequently from people that maybe aren't strong writers. Um, I mean, like Jeff said, the, the reading is really important. I think I, I really do believe you don't have to have a passion for writing, but I do believe it's something, it's a skill that very much can be improved upon. It gets better and better as you do it. Even if you've been doing it like some of us for many, many years, you get better all the time. I, my mom is a journalist, so I came from a family of actually journalists and, and, and now novelists and this kind of thing. And I mean, she's now almost 70 and she's getting better. I read all her books and they're getting better all the time. So, I mean, my, my advice would really be just to practice it and don't tell yourself that you're not good at it. You're probably good at lots of other things. It might not be your strongest point, but it just can be another thing in your arsenal and you can strengthen other areas of your, you know, sort of employability as well. 
but I would just, my advice would be just to practice. And there's so many opportunities now, like you can just start your own blog on a subject that you really do care about, um, you know, or something that you just think would be funny to do for six months or something, you know, like just get yourself writing in some way. Yeah, I would say that, you know, there, with writing there are so many different styles that, like whether you're a good writer or a bad writer is really subjective, right? But a couple of things, if you're an employer looking for somebody who's going to write for you, is you want you want them to be accurate. And like if, this sounds like an old old timers thing to say, but you want facts and spelling to be correct, and you don't want typos and and just sloppiness to be in a product that you give to somebody. You really you really have to show that you care about what you're doing and make it as good as it possibly can be, just in terms of I'm not saying be like a literary giant or anything, but just don't be sloppy because first thing I would do. If I saw somebody's, you know, uh, CV or example of their work, and I saw like a sloppy typo in it, I probably would not want to hire the person because I think what most employers are looking for in any job, at communications especially, is just um, reliability. And uh, you know, they don't, they're not looking for somebody who's going to write the most flowery prose, but somebody who's going to write something that people can grasp really quickly, and that they're not, and that it's going to be. Uh, not embarrassing to the people that put it out. I'll tell you one story. I, I, I had a job in Regina at the uh, Leader Post newspaper. I was trying to be a sports writer at a big daily, and they, they hired me to be on the, the desk there, which is kind of an ironic thing, because they you're the person actually laying out the pages and writing the headlines, so you're actually kind of and editing the story, so you're actually kind of have to be better than the writers. This was the way that I got into writing. and. Uh, I spell like I don't know if any of you are from Saskatchewan, but rough the Rough Riders are like the biggest thing ever there. And in a headline, I spelled Rough Riders two words, and that's the Ottawa Rough Riders, not the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And it ended up in the paper the next day. And I was like 21 years old or something, and I got this huge like the entire paper photocopied, like the entire page, and just written in big, huge grease pencil. You make us look like, and then I won't use the other words, uh, idiots uh, when you do things like this. And that was in my mailbox, and I'm like, and so I, yeah, if you have a couple of, of experiences like that, you kind of, yeah, you kind of like scared to make a mistake for the rest of your life. So I kind of probably have that same thing in my mind. I just don't do that with a grease pencil. So just, just try to be, try to be uh, proud of what you do, and try to have it as mistake free as you can. I think also just be brief yeah, because yeah. you know we, we yeah. like you know we you do get a lot from people and you I mean I want to be able to respond to people but I just need to kind of be able to scan like you know three very quick paragraphs or something yeah so don't feel you have to lay it all out there in the email just give the person enough so that they want to have a coffee with you is my advice too long didn't read you keep that in mind when you're writing get rid of any other words that don't need to be there just so you have the main point and find somebody who you can work with who can compliment your mistakes or your weak areas so that if they can proof over what you're doing. It's way easier to prove somebody else's writing. Way, way easier. I can find that, mistakes in there. Yeah. We used to say that the desire to edit is sometimes stronger than the desire for sex. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, this question is for Susan. Susan, you're in sales, so yes. can you tell us how much or what type of writing you do in your job versus what you do in building relationships with the people that you're working with? So, um, writing in relation to sales in um, the newspaper certainly has everything to do with the presentations that I make. Um, and a uh, good point, keep it short. Um, I have to do needs analysis with my customers, um, which then I develop a, a, a concept. Um, I have to do copywriting, um, and of course that pres that all important presentation, which is still the you know the slides and um, so yeah, succinct and to the point and um, and taking into consideration what the person has said to me, reflecting it back to them in terms of what we, the newspaper or online, the, you know, the, the digital um, format can do for them. So um, 
lots of communication in there and it has to be effective and the only way that I can be effective doing that is by listening. So saying as little as possible and keeping my ears open. And the second part of that question, there was two parts. Mm. No? Did I cover it? I think the second part was just about the relationship building. Like you said, sales. Everyone needs to learn how to sell. Yes. So yeah. can you give us one new tip on sales that were... Sincerity. Authenticity. Being real. Um, you know, I, today when I go out and see somebody who's who I've never met before, they don't know me from any anybody and, you know, um, I, I get, I can pick up right away sales terror. Oh my God, this is a salesperson. <laughs> you know, I can see it. And um, I get that. And that comes from um, a historical um, character who was, yeah, you know, in your face, and hard, hard, hard. That's not what sales is about. Sales is about relationship building. And, um, I'm sure everybody here knows a lot of relationship is listen. Thank you. Communications programs and uh, professional writing programs seem to turn out very good generalists without uh, industry specific knowledge, whereas I'm looking around now, I'm just finishing the Master of Professional Communication program here at Royal Roads. And my background is also very general. I manage the Chamber of Commerce, which is, in, you're doing a little, a small chamber, so you're doing a bit of everything. A lot of the employers now for the you know, really interesting comms jobs, uh, they're looking for industry experience as well. How would you recommend that we go about getting it? Because I don't have that. so. You know, I don't have all the skills that are required for the job, but this is what I'd like to aspire to. Can you sort of give us some idea of how to get there? One, one thing that I sometimes recommend to people is just find something that you're really passionate about and then volunteer your services to that organization as a communications person. So mostly nonprofits or organizations need someone to communicate for them in some way. They're desperate for someone that can write well and that is organized and can do something maybe in, with media relations. So volunteer just to get a bit of experience. Then if you're in a job interview, you can at least show some of your work, even though it's unpaid, but that you've done this and it's recent and it might be familiar to whoever's sitting across from you. That's one way. Also, take a look at the organization and figure out what they actually need. They, they're putting this, uh, job posting out and this is what they say they need, but take a look and see what they actually need and then match your skills. Show them why you're the best person. If you're a communications expert, that shouldn't be hard at all. You're, you're great at this, here's your actual needs, and present that to them. And I find that that usually works. A lot of people don't know what they actually need, they just know what they want. Well, and often I think they're looking for someone who's a strong manager, and you have that background. I think you've managed something like the chamber, and you can have lots of balls in the air at the time, and that's a big component of probably any of our jobs. So. Mm -hmm. I think, as Tricia said earlier, that you know, um, business experience, uh, understanding business language, um, that's very helpful, and you've been exposed to that. And I, I think that goes for anybody. You know, have a look at what your history is. Um, you know, very often, uh, you know, a, a, somebody that's been at home raising four kids, for example, um, coming into a, a position may not have, you know, specific set that's that they're looking for. But wow, what what organizers? You know, so you've got skill sets just with your chamber experience, for example, that are hidden in there that you're not recognizing. Pull them out and highlight them. As, you know, a lot of people are looking for industry experience, but or they say they are, but yeah. they're really looking for somebody they can count on, yeah. and somebody who can do the, the specific things they need. So that's hard. To, that's hard to, to convey if you don't have a relationship with somebody. So first of all, I would mind any relationships you have with anybody, and, and just ask them to keep an eye out for any jobs that are coming open. Because I mean, let's face it, the way people hear about jobs is like that most of the time, right? Second thing I would say is. Um, if you if there is a job opening and you, you're you're fortunate to get an interview, um, research the place that you're interviewing for. Because, for instance, at, at uh, Representative for Children and Youth, we do a writing test, and 
it'll be something like write a news release based on um, this executive summary from our report. And if you have some previous knowledge of the of the uh, organization and what they do, your chances of turning around a good news release in a short period of time are probably better. So just be as prepared as you can. The other thing is, I mean, you might you might not get the exact job you want right away. You might have to take something sort of somewhat related to the field you want, and maybe a junior position, and then move up. Mm -hmm. There's lots of mobility in communications, though, and as soon as you sort of establish working with somebody and that you can be counted on and you're basically you're a nice person um, to work with and you're reliable, you'll find that you can move through it. I, I find that there's a lot more mobility in communications work than there is in, say, journalism, for instance. Right now, journalism is like, the market is kind of, it, it's not a, anywhere near what it used to be in terms of mobility. But communications, like, uh, even now in a sort of a downturn time, Victoria, there's lots of jobs. Like there, or there are lot, there's lots of opportunity to move. So. Thank you. I've got a question for Jason. Um, if you're, no, sorry. If, um, as a freelancer, how do you go about kind of building a clientele? One by one. One by one. Like yeah. you just did you just put ads out there? How did you start? I I started uh, while I was in school. I, how did I become a, a freelancer? Um, initially, it was. I, while I was in course at uh, Railroads and, and Elance had been sort of been making its way um, into the news. It was getting popular. Um, there's, a, there's a million different job boards that you can go out and, and, and find work on right now. It may not be the best strategy now because you're going to get paid $1.25 for 500 words. If you're working for less than the minimum wage, then you're not doing yourself any favors, no matter how much you want to write. Um, going out uh, here locally, I find uh, I'll do, I'll just grab the newspaper and say, oh, here's an interesting article about somebody in the business section. I'll approach them and identify some opportunities that I see for them. Um, I try not to be very salesy, but um, back to the earlier question, we're all salespeople, always. I mean, that's what we do. It's We're communicating a message and generally somebody's paying us for that message, so we better be selling something. Um, with that, I just, I'll take a look at what they need and try and help them find a way to do it, do what they're doing better or find a new market for them. But I always look for an opportunity for my clients to sort of help them improve. Um, nobody ever is upset because you're talking to them about their business. That's mm -hmm. usually one of their favorite things. So I would imagine that you network quite a bit though to get customers referrals? Yes. Sort of um, when Twitter came on, uh, is anybody in the communications program? Hey, you've all worked with Gil? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He's awesome. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's quite entertaining. He introduced us to Twitter, uh, our, our program, and some of us really, really enjoyed it, some of us didn't. Um, great experience there at another social media, and, and yeah, you're uh, doing fantastic there. Um, it's you can do a lot of off online networking, um, locally and internationally. Uh, getting out and doing the BNIs, the Chamber of Commerce, the um, any of the networking events that are out there, there's a lot of great opportunity there. Um, but it all comes back to what you put into it. Um, working with the people, building the relationships is yeah the best way to do it. And if you can do that in social media and sitting at home in your chair, which is where I prefer to be. Um, or out in networking events, even just like this, it's just working with people and finding out where they are. And I found that the best way to get clients for my business is just to do really good work. And I've only, like I said, I've only owned this business for a year and a half, and I've done like almost no networking. Like I've literally been at like four events or something like that because I have two little kids at home, like really little, and. My partner and I, we just try and do really good work and all the work has come from referral. So it's all come from one client telling someone else. And that's a little bit of how our little city works as well. And we have a small pool here. And so I think if you do really good work and you stand behind you know, who you are and 
try and do your best always, then the work will come your way. Your way. That's a huge point. Stand behind your work. Um, if you put it out there, you're representing that company. Um, if things go south, find a way to fix it. If things do well, give the credit to your client for you know having the foresight to choose you. But standing behind your work is the best thing you can do in Victoria. Own your mistakes, but um, yeah. And I mean, you're, we're in the business of helping them, right? We're doing something for their business that's going to help them achieve something that they're trying to achieve. So there's often a lot of goodwill that comes back when they do start to see the results from what you've helped them do. So it's a really, it can be really nice back, like, um, back and forth, you know? So when it comes to uh, relationship building and social media, students like me who came from China, we don't have access to social media like LinkedIn, like Facebook, and Twitter. So those things are really new to us. And do you like to give us Chinese uh, students some very basic tips about how to build our own network and uh, to do all these kind of social media marketing thing. So especially for those who are passionate in marketing and communications. These guys are the new here to me. <laughs> um, are you on Twitter now? Just, just set up my own account. That's it. I okay. Got it <laughs> so the the question is, um, what what are your tips in social media? Is yeah. to network yeah, and so communicate. Just, yeah, we're really new to all this. Okay. Um, clearly, being uh, where everybody is in social media, um, especially in Victoria, is best number one. So being on Twitter and being on Facebook. That's the way to go. Get on there, and then reaching out. You know, reading, reading what people are writing, and connecting with them, asking them questions. Um, it, it's all about connecting. And then, you know, if if there's common interest and and you know a, a good following along what that person or group is doing that you've connected with, ask them to go for a coffee. You know, meet at the atrium for a coffee, and then and then get to meet them face to face. Before you know it you'll have a very large, large group of face-to-face of, um, -face connections and, and online. And people prefer not to meet face-to-face. -face. Um, and, and ask questions and offer information and be engaged. Just, just signing up and sitting and watching is not going to do it. You have to reach out. Um, I'll, just a short story. I started on Twitter uh, three months after Twitter started. Um, I'm a bit of a geek. I think I mentioned I worked for Hewlett Packard for a little while, so <laughs> um, I got a sense that Twitter was going to go somewhere. So my name is Susan Jones. There's thousands and thousands of Susan Joneses in the world. So it's important to me where I can get my name, I grab it. So fortunately with Twitter I was able to grab it. So I'm at Susan Jones. And I have about 6,500 followers, but that's been, what, Twitter's been around seven years. I'd have to say um, a good chunk of those followers are in Victoria. So most people, when they first get on Twitter, they look for oh, who's got the most followers in Victoria. Oh, there's Susan Jones, so they start following me. And if I see there's an interest, you know, in, in their their profile, it's very important how you put your profile out. Um, or if you put a question out that's you know I might be able to help you with, I'll answer. And then it's back and forth. And the next thing you know, I'm asking you to go for a coffee. I can't tell you how many coffees I've had. Oh, some tons. It's fantastic. Um, so then I started engaging with um, IBM uh, on Twitter. Um, they have a, um, a chat once a week about marketing. Um, I have to confess, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in marketing. I, I sell advertising, but I'm not an expert in it. And um, reached out to this group. Um, in the states where they they meet once a week on Twitter and I was getting all this fantastic information in this chat it's like wow I'm learning a lot these are real this is real life stuff um, and and they were marketing people that are within the IBM organization and it clicked so why haven't we got a chat in Victoria we're so you know we're networking we're engaged we should have a chat. So um, I fired up the chat machine, and it's YYJ Chat every Tuesday night. 
Um, so we do our format a little bit different. We invite guests into the chat that um, are relevant to Victoria. And our reach is anywhere between 30 and 60,000. We don't get that many people chatting, but the lurkers in the background, amazing. Um, so our chat last night, for example, we had uh, four people on who were all up for a social media award in engagement. And um, social media camp is another way that you can you know, get involved. So the, the whole social media um, aspect in Victoria is phenomenal. It, it truly is. Get engaged and, and you'll, you'll, the rewards will be great. Um, I have a question. I would just really be interested to hear kind of what a day is like for each of you, sort of how it's being put around and sort of, because some of your jobs are ones that I know that we're sort of interested in, so it would be nice to hear about kind of how the flow of your day works. Probably the most important thing is that every single day is different. Um, in my in my role, anyways, um, I've, I'm trying really hard to do um, what Jason talked about, which is that work-life balance. So um, I work in a, sort of in and around my children as best I can. So there's it involves like a job to preschool and then a pickup in the middle of the day and things like that. But um, if I look at say yesterday, for instance, I think I worked with more than I normally would with about six different clients. So often, a, always a lot of emailing and phone calling, calling and. I always talk to my partner, my business partner, at about 9 in the morning. We each kind of say what's the most imperative or what we're kind of concerned about for that day. Like, do you, do you have anything that could help me with this? Do you know, you know, when I'm sending this out to this media person, do you know this person? Those kinds of things. Can you check this? Always um, editing anything that goes out for the other person before it goes out. Um, I'm, I'm putting on an event in Sydney for the mayor, so I met with some people. Um, about that event and try to figure out how to engage as many people as, poss as possible to make it sort of the best PR kind of event that we can for my client. Um, in the evening after going for a run then wrote another press release and sent it out so that it could go out this morning, like sent it for approval so it could go out this morning. So it's a lot of like I really try and one thing uh, I think Susan said earlier we were talking about you know if you have children you what I've learned is that with each baby I have, I can figure out how to do things really quickly because I don't have very much time. So if it used to take me two hours to do something like research a press release and then write it, now I can do that in an hour because I have to. I have to be as efficient as possible and that's really good as a business owner because I can get a lot done and I can sort of bill all my hours that I'm sitting there working and that's really my objective. So um, yeah, I find I have a goal in my mind every day of how many hours I want to bill it's a bit of an antiquated system, but that's just still what we what we're using, and um, maybe we'll change that at some point. But yeah, I think part of part of every day should include a little bit of thinking about new business, like thinking about where like after April, what are we doing, you know, or who do I need to follow up with to see what project might be coming on the pipe, those kinds of things. So yeah, so it's always a little bit different. But for me, I definitely am trying to like have dinner with my family and take my kids on the trampoline in the afternoon and then I'll go back and I'll be working from 8 to 10 at night but I'm doing it so that I can do the things that I want to do yeah and that's why I don't network very much because everything's at like five o'clock or you know around the dinner time and that's the worst time of day for me so I'll do coffees and stuff with people that I think might be good to refer us business but I'm not really out at the event so I'm kind of a loser <laughs> you know but but it's work. Yeah, it works. Really Except for those days when you're eating dinner with the kids on the trampoline. Yeah. <laughs> um, I traded my 9 to 5, or 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for a 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, as I'm speaking about work-life balance. Uh, my day sort of starts, get up, look and see what's coming for new emails, take the dogs for a walk, try to be at the desk for 9 o'clock, um, work until lunchtime. Uh, I'm currently trying to finish Reddit. You guys heard of the website? Yeah, I'm trying to read all of it. So, uh, most of my day, I'm trying to write, um, and I like to put two hours a day just to prospecting. Um, I I love prospecting, and if you guys are, if you've ever gone fishing, prospecting is the same kind of thing. It's you know you want to try and catch the biggest fish you get. Whether you can do anything with it or not is you know it's up to you. But uh, um, 
it's a big part of, of freelancing is you've got to make sure that you've got business coming in today and down the road, but then you still have to honor the commitments that you've made to all the clients that you've already acquired. So uh, it can be long days, but you do have a lot of flexibility. You get to go golfing whenever you want, unless you've got deadlines, and you've always got deadlines. So, so no golfing. Well, watch it. <laughs> Um, I've often said, um, you know, to different um, bosses, like, I would love for you to walk with me for a day. <laughs> um, I, I've actually gone into some boss's office and said, are you busy today? Let's go. And it, it, my day is literally starts running from the moment that I get up. I'm, I've got deadlines, generally three a day. Um, you know, ads have to be in and, you know, proofing and, and so there's that whole aspect of it. And um, it's, it is a goal that I generally succeed at um, to be away from my desk from 9.30 in the morning until about 3.30 in the afternoon. <coughs> so I am seeing people consistently during that time, talking to them about their marketing, talking to them about their advertising, what they're doing, what their goals are. Um, meeting people for coffee, um, and, and that's what I love. I absolutely love that. Finding out about people's businesses, their lives, and you know how we how we can help. So um, it's it's very busy, but I enjoy that. And and then it's downtime. Yeah, just take a breather, and then back up again with my volunteer stuff. So um, I give myself those breaks through the day, but it's it's. Um, it's fun, and it, but it is go, 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 go. Um, I've had a lot of different jobs, and my days have been different, but now at the representative's office, I've got three employees, basically, and so my job is to kind of manage everything, that, all the communication that goes out from our office, which is quite a bit. It wouldn't seem like it would be, but it, there's a lot. So I'm talking about written communication, Whenever the representative does an interview, um, if we're responding by email to somebody, or we're ta I'm taking a call from somebody. So um, that's sort of the overarching job. So I have people doing things for me, say like writing newsletter articles or uh, writing news releases. And so my job is to kind of shepherd all that. My actual day looks like this morning, I, I was up at um, about 6.15 and I had to uh, email the representative to remind her that she had an interview with CBC at 6.35 a.m. because um, I'm the uh, default phone number if they can't reach her, so <laughs> I make sure she, she does a lot of interviews and she just needs a little bit of a reminder sometimes, so that, that's, that's one thing I do. Uh, I'm involved in a lot of meetings uh, with the executive, with people who are on the project team for writing this a report like this so we have, we'll have researchers writing a report like this and I'll meet with them through various iterations of the project and then it sort of becomes mine at the end to try to make it a little more readable um, so I'll have, I'll have various meetings with those I'll be sometimes spending time on the phone with the graphic artist who has to put together the graphics to illustrate this and I'll have to give some instruction to her for instance we we were trying to get an idea of what are the various possibilities when a family tries to access mental health services? And I'm not, I'm not sure we really succeeded on this graphic, but this kind of gives you all the different possibilities that could arise. And so, designing that was part of the part of my day. Um, right now, I'm looking for an employee actually, and uh, some some of my days HR, like uh, putting together a job description, and it'll send me doing interviews and stuff like that. Um, I sign a lot of. I sign up a lot of papers to spend money and I don't even look at them that carefully and that's what I'm worst at. Like I don't, I'm not a financial person at all. So I'm learning how to do the HR finance stuff, but it's sort of the part I would shelve if I didn't have to do it. Um, and then I, like in terms of work-life balance, I've always had jobs where you could put something on the shelf for a while and go do what you need to do. So for instance, we went to the provincial basketball championships a few weeks back my son's team and when I help coach and so I would I just left the office for five days and I did my work remotely and luckily I'm at a place where they understand that and they'll they're okay if I get up at five in the morning while I'm in on the road with the team and work for three hours and then work for four hours at the end of the day or whatever so but you only get to that 
you only get that kind of a job if you can show that you can deal with, with that and produce and produce on time. If you don't produce on time, then you're probably not going to get that latitude, which I'm really lucky to have. So that's kind of, and you know, <coughs> the normal dog walking in the morning and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's lucky to have a lot. I'm lucky to have a job that allows me to do that and uh, allows me. And but 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 and then it means you end up working on weekends and you end up working Sunday nights or this. I think Monday I got back with from my uh, a hockey camp in Langley with my son at on a nine o'clock ferry on Sunday night and had to get up at uh, five thirty to write speaking notes for the representative on Monday morning because I forgot my computer at home on the weekend and couldn't do it in the hotel room. So there's all kinds of things like that where you're balancing and. Uh, essentially, I'm rounding on a bit, but the uh, the day is quite varied in a lot of different things, which I guess is good. So, if I can make a suggestion, and there's no questions, but um, I'll, I'm just going to put this out. Um, every political party is gearing up right now for the provincial um, election, and each one will have a communications person. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're into politics or what your bent is. If you're looking to get some experience, you don't get paid, but phone them and ask them if you can work with the communications end of it. You'll gain tremendous experience. And just keep an eye out for those kinds of opportunities. And don't be afraid to ask if you can do a walk along with somebody who's in the communications business. Um, sit with them for a day. Do you mind if I shadow you? Um, you know, that was a great question and, and sometimes you don't, you just don't know what you're getting into unless you have that real life experience and often companies and people are very open to it. I would caution you, like I think that's a great idea, I would caution about the election thing because this is a fact of life. If you go and work for, uh, I'm just going to use a particular party who doesn't win the election, you may get branded as somebody who's aligned with that party and then when it comes to getting a job in government in the next time around you may be in trouble. So one thing as communicators that you really have to do is try to be apolitical because as soon as you align yourself with somebody that means that when they're not in power anymore you're done. And there'll be there'll probably be a several of those people that when the, if the government changes hands that that happens to in the communications field just because that's, that's the way it works. So I'm just going to say on Susan's point is when I was 22 or 23 maybe, I totally was like at a crossroads where I didn't know what I was going to do. It was before I had gone to journalism school, I had an undergraduate degree. I was living in Vancouver. I had a great job at a law firm, one of the great big law firms was working in the law library and I decided, okay, well I have this Bachelor of Arts and I'm going to go to law school, I'll be a lawyer. I had good grades and everything. So I wrote the LSAT and got accepted to a couple of schools, not really my first choices, but a few decent schools in you know various places in Canada. And I was working at this law firm and there's just something that I was like, this does not seem like very much fun. <laughs> like no one really seems to be enjoying themselves here. I could see the students, right? So that would potentially be me in about like three or four years from then. And they were, so they were not even that much older than me. And they were just in there slogging it out and, you know, at all hours. And I thought, you know, and my mom was a journalist and I thought, you know, I'm just going to go and do like an unpaid internship somewhere and see what it's like. So I went to Western Living Magazine in Vancouver and phoned them and, you know, probably because my, maybe because my mom had written for them or something, but got an internship there. And I literally was there about an hour and I was like, this is what I want to do. There's no doubt in my mind. And I remember phoning my parents and saying, guess what? I'm not going to law school. <laughs> and I'm going to quit my job at the law firm. And I'm going to do, I'm doing an unpaid internship and I can sort of see them going, oh, great. You know, we'll be supporting her for the next 10 years. But. I mean, it just was like that, and I worked, I did that little internship for six months, and then I just looked for freelance opportunities. I started journalism school that September instead of law school, and it was only a one-year program, and then I, I, I mean, I think we're talking, um, someone said earlier about, you know, t take opportunities and then that they're maybe not your perfect thing and then move your way up. I mean, I, li I moved to Houston, Texas from Vancouver. I mean, Vancouver is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Houston, Texas is not, <laughs> let me tell you. But, you know, I, I got such good experience there. I mean, that was a place that was hiring people that were junior, you know, that could go into a junior role as a, as a journalist, and that's what I was looking for. So I made a sacrifice to go there, but it turned out to be one of my best moves because I was able to get that experience. 
And then once I was there and had a work visa, then I could kind of look around a little bit more and do a bit more freelance and that kind of thing. So, but I mean, you kind of got to take a chance on yourself. And, you know, I found funnily enough that once I moved back to Canada, once I kind of got booted out after September 11th, it was harder to stay. Um, you know, in being back in Canada than Calgary, people really were like, oh wow, you worked in the States. Like it was a really big deal. Whereas at the time it was really like, kind of almost like a fluke that I ended up there. But so, you know, don't kind of discount any, any opportunities that come your way because they can really end up being, you know, kind of another feather in your cap that someone might be really, you know, impressed by at some point. And for me, I just got the experience of getting to be a better writer and really understanding how a magazine works, you know, and, and whether or not I wanted to keep doing that, so. I think it's really important that, like, find somebody who will help you out. It's all about relationships rather than um, maybe even putting, it's maybe more important than putting your resume out is just try to find somebody you connect with and, and let them sort of show you the ropes. Like, I got my first newspaper job by complete fluke. I, I was, uh, my friend was in uh, DJ school in Winnipeg, like, to be a radio disc jockey, and uh, he got a job and we were living together in Winnipeg when we were waiters. He got a, we were 19 years old, and he got a job at a radio station in a small town in Saskatchewan. And he ended up, it was a, a town with like two newspapers, a radio, and a TV station. So there's lots of kind of aspiring journalist broadcasters. And he moved in with the, with the sports editor of the newspaper there. And he was moving up to be the news editor, and they were looking for a sports editor. So my friend said, hey, i got a friend who likes sports. Why don't you interview him? So... The guy actually phoned me and said, would you like to interview for the job? And I had nothing to show him. So what I did was I watched a Stanley Cup game on TV that night, and I typed out a story that I would think would be a good game story. And then I drove the eight hours to get there. And I met this, this was the, the, one of the owners of the newspaper. I met him in a coffee shop. In, it was the York and Saskatchewan, there was like 12, 15,000 people. And I met him in a coffee shop and we had a coffee and he, taught, he asked me about my family and he asked me about where I lived and those, those kind of questions, what I like to do and stuff. And then he goes, by the way, uh, you're hired. You can start a couple weeks from now. And I said, oh, that's great. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. And he goes, and then we're paying, he's paying the bill at the hotel and he goes, have you ever written a story before? And I said, well, not really. And he goes, have you ever taken a picture? And I said, no. He goes, don't worry, we'll show you all that. And that's how I got my start. And I know like, I, that's, that was fluke and everything, but I took it and ran with it and moved, moved to a town that didn't really know anybody in. I was like 19 and it was a great opportunity and I was at least smart enough in that sense to realize that it was a good opportunity. And this was a great little newspaper and they showed me the whole ropes of, and I was covering school board and all different kinds of things and expanding horizons. And I think if you see an opportunity like that, you you know, there are still opportunities like that. They're farther between, but uh, for journalism, but not for communications necessarily. And um, in fact, a friend of mine here in Victoria, who I knew through other things, wanted to get into newspapers about 10 or 15 years ago, and I, I suggested to him find a small town newspaper that will hire you. And he did. He went up to um, I can't remember if it was Williams Lake, I think, or even maybe even a smaller place to start. And he's still working in journalism, and he didn't have a degree either, so. I don't think it's uh, necessarily what you have on paper. It's how, it's how you jump on an opportunity and, or try to create an opportunity. And one of the things I did not want was like I knew sports and, uh, and I used that as a as leverage. So find something you know about it and you're interested in, and then try to parlay that into a job because that's probably where you're. That's probably the kind of job you'd like to have anyway, right? So use your expertise. You may not recognize what it is, but there's probably a way to parlay that into a position somewhere. The only thing I'd add on that is don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Um, the worst answer you can get is no. Uh, nobody, except in Jeff's case, nobody's going to come up to you and present you with an opportunity that is, you know, just from heaven. Um, ask for it. Uh, find a way to provide value and then leverage the hell out of it. Make sure you do everything you can to show them that you appreciate the opportunity and, and you're the right person for the job. And it'll work out well. In theory. <laughs> um, you guys all know in communications, they always say there's more work than jobs. So for us new grads who might want to start, um, make their own job to, to get the work, as a young communica communications grad um, going to consulting, do you have any tips that you wish that you'd known when you were um, 
starting out, or what would you look for in a, in a new business? For me, uh, probably uh, portfolio. Um, take a look and see what you've written already. It doesn't have to be anything that you've published anywhere. Um, with the low barrier to entry on the internet now, I mean, really, you should be able to publish it anywhere. If you've written it well, find an audience that, that it will work for, ideally get paid for it, but you don't. I mean, in the beginning, it's not always going to happen, but uh, I would have a good collection of a portfolio and, and sort of take a look. That would be where I would start before a resume. What sort of communications work do you want to do? Um, I would like to do some consulting for um, either something locally in Victoria, um, especially brand management and kind of larger um, strategic planning for businesses. Well, I mean, it might be a good idea to identify a few of those businesses and try to come up with a, a projected plan, how you could help them increase their profile, or their, obviously they want to know how to increase their business, right? So if you can use your imagination to come up with very simple ways that can be achieved fairly quickly, and you can make a, you can turn something into a result that they don't have to gamble on that much, if they get one result that they think you've done a good job on you, and you've showed up on time and done your work on deadline, I think you could probably parlay that into more work. And really, like, I mean, I'm not, a, you guys would have a much better idea than me, but I think it starts with one customer or client, right? And then, as they said, like word of mouth. So I think you, use your imagination, right? Like, don't, uh, I don't think anybody has to put an ad out for looking for somebody to do that. You may be able to sell it to them just by walking in and having coffee with the owner. You can't be, I was talking about this with somebody, I can't remember who they were, but just about the importance of not being afraid to talk to people. Like, like, like uh, you said, the worst thing they could say is no, I mean, it's no loss to you if they do say no, so don't be afraid to cold call them. That's, that's what we were talking about. It's just the ability to cold call somebody, like it's a sales term, but it's the same if you're a journalist or if you're a, a communicator or whatever. You have to go phone people and just talk to them and, and tell them what you're looking for. And I, I think most people appreciate somebody who can do that directly without being intimidated, and so that's a big key to communications work period so and that's the way to get started I'd say. So I think that's initiative. Um, you, you show the initiative and, and you, you trailed off your sentence with nonprofit. There's a ton of nonprofits that would just love to have somebody come along and say, you know what, I need to build up my exposure. I need to build up my portfolio. I'm going to do this for you. Would you like would you like that? And then, and I think a lot of those nonprofits, uh, I may be wrong with this, but some of them wouldn't have savvy on the internet and social media. So if you can offer that to them, that would that could be a boon. Like, and that could be the same for a lot of different companies who aren't sort of into the modern age yet. You know, show them how you can help them in various ways, including that, and you might be able to. You might have, and that's where being younger or out of, just out of school could help you have credibility in that sense. There's there's a vast amount of companies and nonprofits in town that don't understand on like anything online still because the people aren't engaged in it that are often at that leadership level. Um, my partner and I just taught a media training workshop for nonprofits about a month ago and almost I mean we went we were kind of just talking about how to raise their profile in general and help them with their fundraising and that kind of thing and I mean they're all just saying the same thing is that they don't have anyone to be a doer, right? They don't have they can't afford to hire someone to do that for them. So if you're, you know, looking to gain experience, then then that's um, would be a good place to start. Be a doer. I like that. Be a doer. <laughs> and I mean, I do think you kind of have to grind it out. Like when I went, I went, I basically went to Houston to visit a friend, and I thought, you know, I'm going to go to the library because it looks like a really nice library <laughs> downtown, beautiful old American library, and I just. Um, printed off every single publication in Houston, there's like five pages of publications, and I phoned every single one and said the same thing, I'm Canadian and I'm visiting here but I'm looking for a job and would you have me come in and just get to know your magazine and I could do a few odd jobs but you actually can't pay me. It was actually a perfect in, right, because I couldn't be paid because I didn't have a visa or anything. And I did that like to about 65 magazines and I had about five of them come back to me and one of them was health and fitness. 
and I worked, and then I went there and met them. And I mean, I think a big part of it that I can't express enough, but we've all kind of said it in different ways, is basically people will hire you if they think you're a nice person and they want to have you around. Yep. To be honest, like a lot of it goes on personality. And in my last firm, I hired all our interns and kind of more junior uh, folks a lot out of um, Camosun and this program and, and at UBEC. And um, you know. The most, like a big portion of it was just like, this person would be a great fit for our team, you know, because they're really, they're really enthusiastic, they have a nice personality, they look like kind of a go-getter. That's like more than half the battle right there. So, and that, I would definitely say that when I was a nobody, just knocking on those doors, that's, you know, I just tried to show that I would, it would be fun for, to have me around, basically, and I think that's what you kind of end up getting hired on. I really do. I think that's a really good point, and I like your point about grinding it out. Um, you know, just as an example, my first job, I know it's a while ago, but I think I made uh, about 700 bucks clear, sorry, 700 bucks before taxes a month. I mean, I was, that was poverty line, like that newspaper job. It was, I, I took a half salary pay cut from being a waiter to take a newspaper job. So it was a bit of a gamble, right? You have to be, it's easier to do when you're young, it's not so easy to do when you have a you have certain uh, expenses you have to cover, but in some ways you may have to be willing to start for less. Um, and then just what you said about applying to every publication. When I when I tried to do this book, I'd never done a book before. And uh, not a lot of people knew who Steve Nash was at the time, unless you were a college basketball freak or something you didn't know who he was. So I tried, I had to sell the idea of writing a book to a publisher and I, I think I think I probably sent out packages to like 65 publishers across Canada and the U.S. and got pretty much nothing back except rejection letters. And that and I was a journalist. Like I'd been a journalist for 20 years, so I wasn't like I was a completely unknown commodity. But um, and that's a big help when you're trying to get in as an author is to be a journalist. But um, finally, I got a, a little company called Polestar that in, used to be in Victoria that decided that they didn't know anything about basketball either, but they decided it might be worth taking a flyer on, so I got a book contract. But you know, probably if I counted my hours of actually putting into this book, plus the travel I did and everything, I probably made about as much money as I would have made at McDonald's doing this book. But it opened the door for a whole bunch of other books, which I made money off of. You know, Polestar boss became the boss of Raincoast, which is a much bigger company, and I got this book, and I made a lot of money off that book, and then uh, this book didn't make that much money, but the the future version for Penguin made quite a bit of money. So it's it's kind of like sometimes it's an investment on the front end, and and you get paid off in the back end of it. So you have to be willing to kind of start at the bottom, I guess is the word. And and the other thing I look for when I when somebody comes in uh, interviews for a job is just the the willingness to learn and the not the sense that they know everything already because. The worst thing is to is to try to. Um, well, I just I've seen a lot of journalism students come out and and they a lot of them a lot of them have a, a lot of great training, but a lot of them really don't know how things work on the ground, and that's fine as long as that's not the attitude that you're getting from them when you're asking them to do something, right? But like you can't all you can't start by winning uh, by writing up Pulitzer Prize winning series. You have to learn from the bottom up, no matter where you come. I think that's a good attitude to have in any job. So I hope everybody's listening to him because he's got a job coming up and he's telling <laughs> you everything that yeah, you exactly. need to give back to him when yeah. you need. <laughs> Actually, we have a job opening right now in our office for a one-year um, temper well one-year temporary assignment communications officer. So um, it's actually a pretty good job. The, the woman that um, was in the job is gone on to take a position at um, the CRD as a web, sort of a more of a web-based person, and she that's her area of expertise. So there's an opportunity. Hi. Um, I just graduated from the BAPC program last fall, and I'm sort of doing what you were, um, I, I've sort of been pounding the pavement looking for a job and haven't had much response. So. My approach recently was to switch to, to like you were saying, Tricia, about just phoning people up and con or contacting them and saying, I'll work for free, I just need to, to do, because I did a career change. 
And um, so, what what do you suggest? The, is there any specific steps? Like, do I cold call? Pardon me, I've been sending out letters. Do I send like a, a e portfolio? Like, what's what's the sort of the best approach? Do you have any? Well, I think um, for me, anyways, like the way I I like people to come to me um, okay. is basically what I said before is I just need to have enough you, you want to get in front of them as quickly as possible mm. you don't want to kind of just send them send them send them stuff so you just need to somehow engage them enough to want to have them have a coffee with you okay. and I mean one thing that's worked really well for me in the past is just to say like I would I was wondering if I could come in and, and just work for, like job shadow you or it for what we call an information interview I really just want to have get information about what what you do here and what your job's all about it's a total like it's like a, it's a cloak, right? You well, really, yeah. yeah. But if you can get them, get in front of them, and then they can see that for one thing, you're you're really looking and you're really willing to. You're going to be that keen person that might be able to help them in some way. Um, so I mean, I would do probably just an email with a request for a coffee and a sort of informational interview. I would kind of start with that. And one thing to remember is that that person is going to be connected to so many other people in their industry. And I mean, we, like I just have this tiny little company and we're not, we're trying not to hire um, anyone right now until our kids are off at school and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, we know a lot of people in the industry and every day you get, you know who might be looking. So it might not be that person, but they, you know, could very well be connected to someone that is. So, okay. so yeah. keep pounding. Yeah, and just, I mean, just make, just have, try and have a positive attitude about it. Like it can be a really difficult thing, and I think everyone's kind of been there at some stage. But just kind of, you know, you don't. You just kind of have to um, be optimistic. Persevere. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing that worked really well for me, but I know it's not possible for everyone. But I, I never thought within a geographical region. Mm. I just thought I'm going to go where I find a, a job, and that for me actually led to like really interesting experiences from from different. I, I also lived in Mexico for one year, and obviously Houston and Calgary and here and in Vancouver. So, you know, I before now I have a family I would be staying here, but you know, and my biggest client right now is in Yellowknife. You know, but it's nice to just kind of like think outside of the box of where you're going to do work, and then try and make it work for yourself. And I mean, this, the Yellowknife one I have, I just said, well. I'd be happy to do that, and I'm in Victoria, so I'll basically be on a conference call like 95% of the time, you know, and then I'll come see you with some notice when I need to, kind of when I'm working with media in your area or whatever. But yeah, so try and think outside of where you are, right. and I think that can really help. That's great advice, thank you. One of the tricks that I've used as well is um, because it's a cold call, there's no way to really sort of show value to them, so I'll send an initial email. I don't, I mean, I'll never do an actual cold call, pick up the phone and hand call. It's always an email because I'm a writer. It's the easiest way to sort of show that, you know, what you're doing. In the email, I'll say, you know, I'd like to discuss this with you on, you know, in person on a further date, but I'll set up a time where we can actually have a phone call so that they know to expect me to phone at one o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Maybe they're busy. I'll get a response on that. Maybe they don't really care. It doesn't really matter, but I'm going to phone on one o'clock on Thursday afternoon. No like and trust is the key to marketing, right? So now they don't know you. They have no idea if they like you, but you did what you said you're going to do, which is the first key to trust. So um, trying to trying to find a way to show that you your actions speak louder than words, kind right. of thing. That closes our kind of session for this morning. Um, on behalf of Roller Roads, we want to just thank you for coming and yeah, taking the time to share some knowledge with us. So thank you.